So over the uh, last couple of weeks, it's been over the last four weeks, we've been um, continuing with our new series, which is um, uh, coming against your three spiritual enemies. How many know, if you're a, a Christian, you are under attack. And, and the Bible says we have three enemies. The first one is the flesh. Um, and we talked about the, the weapons of self-destruction that are weapons that the enemy uses that wants to destroy your life. And then the second enemy is the world. And we covered that. Last week we covered our third enemy, the devil. And um, we talked about how devil is a deceiver, right? He wants to deceive us. What does he do? He tries to, you know, he, he, he literally what he wants to do is he wants to question God's word. And then what he does is twists God's word, right? He wants to deceive us. Um, and there are some more stuff that the enemy does. Um, uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in these heavenly realms. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Who's your great enemy? The devil. What does he do? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to what? What does he want to do? Devour. Let us pray before we begin. Father, we just want to thank you again for your goodness and your mercy and your grace, Father God. We thank you that you're here in this place. And as we continue with this service, Father, we want to dedicate this to you. Father, I want to pray right now that you remove all distractions. Help us to really be um, alert and to hear what you have to say. Father, more of you, less of me. Use me as your instrument. But Father, I want you to be uh, fully glorified this, evening, this morning, Father God. I want to thank you. We praise you, Father God, um, in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Now, if you're taking notes, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the devil is not just a uh, deceiver, he wants to destroy. The devil wants to destroy. Like I said, um, last week we talked about how the devil wants to plant, plant a seed of doubt in your mind. What does he want to do? He wants to make you question God's goodness. Make you question, did, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And then what does he do? Then sometimes the devil uses God's word and he twists it and, and it tries to make you question God's goodness. But if Satan fails to do that, what does he do then? He starts to attack us, starts to uh, attack our bodies. You see, as a serpent, he wants to deceive you. But uh, as a lion, he wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. Um, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about the, uh, our bodies. There's so many addictions, isn't it? When you think about it, you know, um, just think about food. Food is a great thing, isn't it? I love food. I, 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 I do. But too much of it, what does it do? Brings obesity. It can bring heart attacks. You know, when you put on too much weight, it's putting too much pressure on your heart. Um, uh, you know, for those that love sweet stuff, it can bring diabetes. It's horrible, right? Food can be a good thing, but it can lead to bad things. It can destroy your body. Then you think about smoking. You know, every time you buy a packet of smoke, you see pictures on it. It tells you it, it, it can destroy you. It can cause lung cancer, mouth cancer. They even put pictures of it. But what do we do? We still go ahead and buy them and we still smoke. Alcohol. You know, it can be a social thing, right? You start with a social thing and gradually, be, you know, it, it picks up and then becomes more of a habit. Next thing you know, if you're not careful, 
alcohol stops controlling your life. What does it do? Cause liver problems, all sorts of addictions, um, drugs. You know, as a young person, you can be curious. You want to try things. You try with a bit of weed. You smoke a little bit of weed. You get a little bit of high. You feel like you're fitting in. And the next thing you know, that's the gateway to more hardcore stuff. Next thing you know, you find yourself in a, in a very uh, a, a, a difficult place. It can cause you overdose. It can cause you um, all sorts of uh, destructions. And then we have lust. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit, but we're talking about the flesh. You see, lust, the Bible, uh, I mean, God created sex, right? God created sex. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a time and place for it. But what the enemy loves to do is likes to, loves to twist things. And as a result of lust, you can end up with on. Wanted pregnancy with sicknesses and all sorts of disasters can lead to divorce and breaking families. You see, when you read the Bible, it's very clear that Satan wants to use demonic forces to do all sorts of stuff. And he wants to attack your body. Um, I'm just reminded of, uh, you know, in, 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 he caused the man to be dumb, not, not be able to speak or, or hear. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 to 33. When they left, a demon-possessed man couldn't speak, was brought to Jesus. So what did Jesus do? So Jesus cast out the demon, and then the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel, they exclaimed. Then Obviously, Satan has his demonic helpers causing a woman who was bent and disabled for most of her life. In Luke chapter 13, verse 11, it says, Then uh, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. So what did Jesus do? He cast out the demons. He set the woman free. Then, um, we're given an example of, of a, a young child who was getting seizures and, and it was throwing himself in the fire and in the water. Suicidal spirits. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 15 and 18. Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the baby, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. You see, there are so many more examples I can give you, but the truth is that Satan wants to attack your body. He wants to destroy your body. But why is that? Why does he want to destroy our bodies? If you're taking notes, to begin with, your body is God's temple. Remember, when he was casted out, he, Satan hates anything to do with God. We are created in God's image. And he wants to attack your body because now your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, it says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What does he do? Who lives in you? And gives you uh, and, and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. Sometimes we say, you know what? It's my life. I do what I want to do with it. The Bible says, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you do not belong to yourself. Why? Verse 20. For God bought you with a high price. God paid a high price for you. You were a slave, but now you set free. Why? Now you must honor God with your body. God wants us to honor Him with our bodies. Think about it. God is invisible, right? We can see God. God is invisible. And then Jesus has gone to be in heaven, right? 
We don't see Jesus. We don't see God. What do people see? They see you and I. They see Christians. And you and I are the example or are left here on this earth. And that's why we need to glorify God by using our bodies properly. You and I are the examples that people see. That's why in Matthew chapter 5, 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. God wants to use us as an instrument for revealing himself to a lost world. Think about it. Your work colleagues, your neighbor, your friend, some of your family members would never, might never pick up a Bible and read it. Why never enter in a church and, and listen to what God has to say? But you know what, though? They're watching you. They're watching you. They're they seeing what you're doing. And you know what? And God wants us to be an instrument, a good instrument, to bring our people to Him. So if our life is no different to anyone else, what could we be? We could, we could become a hindrance, right? We could become a hindrance for others to know God. Because if you are no different than, than anyone else, why would someone want to become a Christian? I mean, if your life is no different than, than anyone else, why would I want to become a Christian? That's why God says you're a light. You can't. You can live on in darkness. You need to be, let your light shine. In, in Bible, Bible says in 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 9, it says, uh, but you're not like that. You're not like them. You're not like other people. Why? For you are a chosen people. We need to remember that we are a chosen people. We need to remember that you are a royal place, priest, a holy nation. God's very own possession. So as a result, what does he want to do? You can show others the goodness of God. You can be that example that God wants. Amen. For he called you out of darkness. He called you out of darkness. He doesn't want you to stay in the darkness. He wants you to come out of the darkness into his wonderful light. That's what he wants to do. He wants to take you out of darkness and bring you into his wonderful light. You see, God wants to use you. God wants to use you for His goodness to the world. Uh, you see, you are His instrument. You and I are His, His instruments. You see, when, when, you, when, you, when, you look at the, when you look at the sky, when you look at the stars, they're beautiful, aren't they? When you look at the ocean, when you look at the forest, it's beautiful. And what does it show? It reveals God's wonderful wisdom and His majesty and His goodness, right? But when, 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 when you look at a Christian, it reveals God's grace and love. You know, when you look at a Christian, something that was broken and all of a sudden restored, that shows God's grace and love. You see, so our bodies are not just an a temple of God, but it's also our bodies is a tool to reach a lost world. God wants to use our bodies to reach a lost world. At Romans 6, verse 12 and 13, it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. You see, that's what you need to be doing. You need to give yourself completely to God. For you were dead. It reminds us, we were dead. But now you have a new life. We have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You see... When we look at the Bible, we see it over and over. When God wanted to um, uh, build an ark, what did he use? 
He used Noah and his family. Right? He didn't send the angel to come and build the ark. He used Noah and his family. When he wanted a, a, a tabernacle to be built, what did he use? He used people, right? He used their talents and, uh, you know, their gifting and they built the tabernacle. When Jesus wanted to distribute the, uh, the, the bread and the fish, what did he use? He used the disciples, right? And he used the same disciples to go out to preach the gospel. So what does God use? God uses people. God uses you and I. We are his instruments. We are his instruments and he wants to use you. You see, just as God the Son had to take on the body to accomplish his work here on this earth, so the Holy Spirit needs our bodies. The Holy Spirit needs our bodies and that's why we need to be open to the Holy Spirit. Never ever underestimate your body. So there's a lot of lot of weapons that the enemy loves to use, a lot of strategies he uses, but suffering is one of them. And it's horrible. Suffering is bad. But before I go into this segment, now I just want you to know that God is always in control. God is always in control. That whenever Satan wants to attack you. He has to ask for permission. He can't do things on his own. He has to go to God and ask for permission. Can I do this? And if God says yes, then he can attack us. Um, we, I've got examples for this for both in Old Testament and New Testament. In Old Testament, we have the story of Job. I'm sure most of us know, but let me just read it. In Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 12, it says, One day... The members of heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. Who was there? The accuser, Satan, was also there. So he came with them. Verse 7. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord. I've been patrolling the earth. He's been patrolling the earth. Watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan. Have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in the all, all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Verse 9. Satan reply, replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has a good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses. But don't harm him physically. So Satan left Lord's presence. So the first test. Satan goes to the heavenly courtroom and he tells God and he says, you know what? The only reason Job is so obedient, the only reason he loves you, the only reason he follows you is because of his great wealth. Everything that he has. Just take away what he has, and see, he will curse you. First test, his possession. What was Job's response? Job 1, verse 20 to 22. Job stood up and tore his rope in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship God. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb. I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. Verse 22. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Can you imagine? Job lost his children. He lost his wealth. He lost his favor 
with his neighbors. The Bible says he lost favor with friends. He lost favor even with his wife. In all of this, he did not blame God. Then Satan attacks him for a second test. In Job chapter 2, one day the members of heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan asked, answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. And he has maintained his integrity, even though you urge me to harm him without cause. Verse 4, Satan's second attack. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. But reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right. Do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord presence, and he struck Job with a terrible boils, head to feet. Just imagine. Has anyone had any um, skin illnesses and uh, issues? It's horrible. It's painful. I remember chicken, chicken, um, chicken pox. <laughs> Itchy and horrible. Now, this is boils. Imagine uh, just, just the agony that he was in. Serious agony. What was Job's response? Verse 9. His wife said to him, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. What was his response? But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. You see, when Job looked around, his situation was painful. He lost his wealth. He lost his children. He lost favor with his wife. He lost favor with his neighbors. He lost favor uh, with his friends. Then he was sick. Uh, you know, hit with this physical illness, physical pain. It looked like God had literally forsaken him, right? And it is a challenging situation. Let me give you now a, an example of a New Testament example. When Satan wants to attack, he has to ask for permission. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. And this is um, what it says. Simon, Simon, Satan asked has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and you turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. We can see how Simon, Peter, uh, did get tempted, right? He denied Jesus three times and when he did repent, he came back and he was stronger. And he helped his brothers. But I want to tell you something, though. Satan should not get all the credit. He doesn't deserve all the credit, right? Because sometimes suffering can be as a result of a broken world. We live in a broken world and bad things happen because this is a broken world. So sometimes it just happens because it happens. Because sadly, we live in a broken world. Other times could be as a result of our own disobedience. We disobey God and do something that we shouldn't be doing. So what do we do? We have to face the consequences. Because every action has a reaction, right? And there are times when uh, this, uh, God allows suffering because he wants to perfect our faith and help us mature. And the only way we can mature is through going through that season of suffering. For as believers, we have this confidence that God is completely in control. So whatever situation you're facing, remember that God is in control. Amen. So not all suffering is satanic. So um, 
Why does he want to do that? Why, why does he want to bring suffering for Christians? You see, suffering makes us impatient with God's will, doesn't it? It makes us impatient with God's will. Listen to what it says in James chapter 5, verse 11. We give great honor to those who endured under suffering. For instance, you know about Job? We just read about him. A man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. By the way, at the end, God restored everything that was taken away from him. He is a tenderness and merciful God. You see, when Job became impatient, he became impatient with himself when you read the whole book. You can see how he became impatient with himself. He became impatient with his wife. He became impatient with his critical friends. But he never, ever lost his faith in God. He never lost his faith in God. Even though he didn't understand what was going on, Job knew he could trust God and he knew God would defend him. Amen. So patience is so important. If you are patient, um, we can easily, um, if, you, if, you're not, if you're impatient, we can easily throw in the towel, isn't it? When the situation gets tough, we just want to give up and just say, man, this Christianity thing is too hard, man. I just can't do this, right? We become impatient. Have you ever traveled with a, a young child in the car? <laughs> I remember when Doris and Nico were quite younger. When we travel, uh, we set off to go see my parents. You, you, just, you just left the house and they're just like, are we there yet? <laughs> and you're like, we just left the house. And then, and then they're like, okay, we still got four hours to go, guys. And then, and then five minutes later, oh, are we there yet? <laughs> and, 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 and that's exactly what, what, what happens, you know. You know impatience is a mark of immaturity. But also impatience is a mark of unbelief when it comes to us as Christians. That's why in James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Testing of your faith produces what? And then it says, but let patience have his perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So you, you see, when, whenever you find yourself restless, Whenever you find yourself nervous, whenever you find yourself anxious about something, know that uh, yeah, you're not trusting God. That you're not trusting God. Faith and patience literally go hand in hand. If you really, really trust God, uh, then we will wait for His will to be accomplished in our lives. Amen. You see, impatience is not only just a mark of uh, immaturity or unbelief, but is also a mark of fleshly living. You remember, you know, our old nature? Our old nature is, is always impatient. But the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Patience is one of them. So we need to be very careful because impatience always leads people astray. Impatience always leads people uh, into making mistakes. Just think about it, Abraham, right? Abraham, God came and promised him a child, right? God said, I, I, I want you to be the father of many nations and, and you will have a child. What did he do? He became impatient. He married Hagar. And had Ishmael. What happened? That was, the, that was a thorn in his flesh. <laughs> and as a result, we still suffer as a result of his disobedience. All he had to do was wait 14 years. 14 years and he would have had his promised child. What did he do? He became impatient. He wants to uh, help God by, you know, fulfilling his prophecy. <laughs> 
And sometimes we can do that as Christians. God may, might, might make a promise to you, but now you want to take that promise and, 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 and take action yourself. Be patient. Be patient and just wait. Wait for God to move. Remember King Saul. Remember King Saul. He, 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 he wanted to, um, he became impatient. He was waiting for a prophet, uh, Samuel. And, um, you know, everyone has a duty back in the day. So he's, he, he wanted to present the offering. But uh, Prophet Samuel wasn't coming. There was nowhere to be seen. So what did he do? He'd take action in his own hand. He did the right thing, right? He did the good thing by uh, offering the sacrifice. But that was not his job. His job was to wait for the prophet to come to offer the sacrifice. So what happened? He did that, and that was the beginning of the end of his kingdom. Peter, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he became impatient. They come to arrest Jesus. What does he do? He takes out his sword, and he attacks the man. The Bible says he cut his ears off. I mean, he couldn't even aim properly, right? <laughs> he cut the man's ears off. He became impatient. What did Jesus do? You see, Jesus had to uh, take, take action. He had to bring healing to the man. He restored the man. Because if he didn't, Peter could have found himself in a big trouble, right? He could have lost his life. You see, Satan knows that if he can make us impatient, then he can lead us to do something stupid and get ourselves into trouble. That's why he wants to make you impatient. If you're taking notes, number two. So, number one, the devil wants to destroy your life. Number two, the devil is an accuser. He wants to accuse you. I want to bring this to an end this, this morning. So I want, to, I want to talk about this as well because this is so important. Remember in Job chapter 2 verse 1, it says, One day the member of heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. And then how is Satan introduced in this text? Who came? The accuser Satan came with them. You see, Satan is an accuser. You see, when Satan talks to you about God, he lies. But when he talks about you to God, most of the time he tells the truth. <laughs> because he wants to take accusations. Satan wants to make note of everything that you're doing wrong. And he wants to bring it before God and say, oh, did you see what they just did? Did you just see what Abraham did? Did you just see what Abraham did? He just lied about his wife. Did you just see what David did? He committed with adultery with his neighbor. And then he had his husband killed. Are you not going to judge him? Are you not going to judge him? Were you listening, God? I mean, Peter just denied. Just denied you. Just denied you three times. Are you going to let him get away with that? I mean, did you see just Pastor Ras? <laughs> I mean, he lost this cool. He was driving and he just totally lost his cool. Are you going to let him get away with that? <laughs> you see, um, the street slang for what Satan does, he's a snitch and he's a rat. He's a snitch and he's a rat. And he's literally just coming and just observing everything you're doing. He's writing it down. And then he goes to heaven and he says, God, did you just see what they did? He's a snitch and he's a rat. I want to tell you, there, there, there are two type of accusations, right? There's two type of accusations. There's, there's the one that comes from Satan. 
one from Satan. And we need to learn to distinguish them because there's one from Satan and there's another one from uh, the Holy Spirit. You see, normally when you get a feeling of guilt and shame, but you feel like, you know what, I did wrong. But when it leads you to a, a repentance, when it leads you back to God, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that's kind of leading you and making you acknowledge that you made a mistake. But you see, when, uh, when the Satan, the accuser, accuses us, it leads us to regret and guilt and defeat. You see, Satan wants you to just throw in the towel and just say, Man, this is hard. This Christianity thing is just too difficult. I can't do this. You see, but the, when, when the Holy Spirit, um, you know, convicts you, he uses the Word of God in love and seeks to bring you back into a fellowship with God again. You see, when Satan accuses you, he, he uses your own sin in a, in, in a hateful way. He seeks to make you helpless. He seeks to make you hopeless. Just think about it. Judas. What happened to Judas? Judas was so feeling helpless and hopeless that he committed suicide by hanging himself. He listened to the accusation of Satan and caused him to kill himself. But you know what? Peter... Yeah, he swore. Yeah, he got angry. Yeah, he refused Jesus three times. He denied even knowing Jesus. But you know what? He allowed the Holy Spirit to bring him back into a repentance. And he asked for forgiveness. And God restored him. See, Satan knows that, you know, if he makes you feel guilty, if he makes you... Um, you become, you cannot be an instrument of God. When you're guilty, when you're in a place of, uh, you know, uh, self-hate, you can't be used by God. And Satan knows how easy it is for you to repent and ask for forgiveness. True repentance, by the way. I'm not talking about just asking for forgiveness and then continue doing what you're doing the next day. I'm talking about real change. You, you're really sorry about what you did and you want a change. He knows when you come to God, God is merciful and he will make your way. And Satan knows that. And Satan knows if you live under a dark cloud of guilt, you will not be able to witness and you become a defeated Christian. And that's why um, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. Salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. The rat is up there, just ratting us day and night, day and night, day and night. The Greek word uh, for accuser is actually diablos, and it's really mentioned 30, 35 times in the Bible. And it's literally accusing you and I day and night, day and night, day and night. Um, I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with um, the Civic by McDonald's. Um, it's a one-way system. You know, when you, uh, you, you kind of come in from McDonald's way and then you go out from KFC direction out. Um, now, me and my son were going to get some food. And um, I don't know if you ever noticed the Uber drivers, man, they just drive you crazy, don't they? They just don't know, obey any law whatsoever. So I'm coming in. Uh, the right direction, right way, and this Uber driver comes from uh, totally the wrong direction, comes from KFC way, he comes in, he zooms by, 
now I have the right to weigh, but he literally comes and just crosses me. And, and I'm like, what? I was angry. I was angry and upset. You know, I heard a voice in me say, you know what? Satan loves to lie. <laughs> Go ahead and get angry. Go ahead and get angry. You deserve it. Someone needs to stand up against these people. Just hoot your bell. Just do whatever you want to do. Just get angry. Someone needs to stand up against this injustice. And guess what? I listened. Dude, dude. <laughs> I was angry. <laughs> I was upset. Like, how could you just do that? You know what? Shortly after I got angry and upset and I started having a go, all of a sudden the tone of enemy changed. His tone completely changed and then it's like, all, all of a sudden he's like, look at you. And you call yourself a bit, you're, you're a pastor? I mean, you should be setting example. And look how you're just getting angry at this. I mean, your son is sitting right next to you. What kind of example are you to him? What if people see you, you see his tone completely changed. And that's what the accuser does. First, he makes you believe that you're right by getting angry. When you get angry, he gets you to a place of really just, man, look at you. You're hopeless. You're hopeless. I mean, what? What are you doing? You see, before you sin, the devil says, go ahead and do it. You know, it's your right. It's your life. Do it. Just enjoy it. It's your life. God forgives anyway. But then when you do it, he takes you to a place, a very dark place. Just as I bring this message to an end, I just really feel like I just want to share this because this is really, really important. Now, we looked at how... Um, I, I want to look at this prophet, uh, a powerful prophetic text in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Let me give you a little bit of context before I read it. Um, we have three characters in this, in this, in this prophetic text. It, it, it's, it's a vision of... Um, uh, heavenly cultural. So the, the first character is Jesus, right? He's the judge. And then you have um, Joshua, who's the high priest, who's standing before God, and he's, the, uh, he, he's literally being accused. He's on trial. Then you have Satan, who's the prosecutor, and, and Satan is trying to... Um, uh, prove to God that, that Joshua deserves to be judged for his punishment. He's filthy, he's unclean, and he needs to be judged. He's the accuser. And when you read it, it it's kind of like it makes sense, you know, because Satan, uh, you know, has a, has a, has a really a, a valid point uh, that Joshua is guilty and he deserves to be, to be punished. Uh, let me just read it. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 3, Zechariah. Then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick and has been snatched from the fire. God did acknowledge that Joshua was at fault. He's a burning stick, but he has been snatched from the fire. And then in verse 3, it said, Joshua, Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood before the angel. Have you ever gone to a place, an event, and you go totally undressed for that occasion? I remember a long time ago, I, was, uh, I went to this, um, this, this place. I used to lo love wearing trainers. and So I went to this place, and um, um, I didn't get the dress code, so I'm showing up in my trainers. And I see everyone suited up and looking all sharp. And, and I was like, oh, man, 
really feeling uncomfortable because you're not dressed for the occasion. Now imagine standing before God and all your sins are you're filled with sins. All your sins are shown before you. Everything you've done is visible and God can see them. Look at him. And how could he how could he be a pastor? I mean, have you seen what he done in the past? He was a drunkard. He was a, a, a addicted drug drug abuser. He hurt people. How could he be a pastor? Right? I don't know about you, but he could, you know, he could be looking at you and say, like, didn't you just lie? Didn't you just cheat? Didn't you just commit adultery? Don't you battle with lust? I mean, there you are here. You've been looking at porn all week, and now you, uh, you're praising God, and, and you're doing all of this. Didn't you just avoid paying your bills? Are you not running away from paying your bills? You see, the devil loves to accuse, shouting guilt and shame and condemnation. He's the accuser. I want to tell you about the good news. So we know who the devil is, but I want to tell you the good news. Jesus. Who is Jesus? The good news is that Jesus is our advocate. He's our advocate. In fact, before I go to back to the, the story of Zechariah, let me just read what it says in verse John 2, verse 1. It says, My dear children, I'm writing this to you that you will not sin. Oh, we know what sin does, right? We talked about it for the last couple of weeks. I'm writing to you so you do not sin. There's consequences with sin. But it says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before God. Who is he? He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. You see, we have a great enemy who wants to accuse us day in, day night, you know, day and night. He wants to accuse us, accuse us, accuse us. I want to tell you that we have an advocate. That's some good news, Jesus. Let me go back to the story. Verse 4. So the angel said to the others standing there, Take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Joshua, he said, See, I've taken away your sins. And now I'm giving you this fine new clothes. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I'm kind of reminded of prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? The two sons? And... Um, come from a wealthy family and, and it's like, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm young. I want to enjoy my life. What good is money to me when I'm old? Give me my money of inheritance now, Dad. I want to go have fun. I want to go have party and enjoy myself. So he asked his dad for his inheritance money. He got his part. He went out, party, enjoy his life. And, and go all crazy and he lost everything. And long story short, he was living so bad that he just remembered, you know what? My dad's servants, my dad's helpers, they're living better than I'm living right now. Let me go back to my father and beg him to make me a servant. Because then I'll be better off. And the Bible says as, 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 as he was coming back, his father was looking out for him. You know, and as soon as he saw him, he ran towards him with arms wide open. And he hugged him. And what I love is he took off his own robe and put it over him. That's what God does. Satan wants to make you feel like, you know what, I messed up so bad. I don't deserve God. I want to tell you, God is waiting for you. God is waiting for you. He wants to take you out. And in verse 5, Then I said, They should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put on a clean, priestly turban on his head. 
and dressed them in new clothes while the angels of the Lord stood by. Isn't that amazing? Can I have the worship team back on, please? I don't know who needs to hear this. I don't know whether it's someone here in this place or someone online. You know, the devil wants to accuse you. He wants to make you feel like you messed up so badly that you, you don't deserve to come back to church. God doesn't love you anymore. You, you messed up so bad that God doesn't care about you anymore. And constantly you've been accused. I want to tell you, God is standing there with arms wide open. And he's saying, come. Come back to me. Come back to church. Come and, and serve. Come and, and, and be useful. Come and be my instrument. Can we all stand, please? Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy and grace. Your wonderful grace. Father, we mess up so many times. We mess up so many times. But you're so great. You're full of mercy and grace. Father, as we have just discovered how important our bodies are. Father, we just want to pray that you help us, Father God. To keep our bodies clean and pure. Father, we want your Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to be, to, to help, uh, to, to help us to be an instrument to do your will here on this earth, Father. We want to be good examples for you. So, Father God, I want to pray right now for anyone who's struggling with any sort of form of addiction. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to break that and rebuke that curse right now, Father God. We want to thank you for the freedom that's in you, Father God. Father, I want to thank you that you want to make us, use us as instruments. That we can be part of your, your plan here on this earth. That you want to use us as your instrument. So I want to pray right now, Father God, that you reveal to us which part we should play. If you have a, any special gifts, Father God, I want to pray that right now you reveal those gifts to your children, Father God. Father God, we want to be uh, a, a good example. So, Father, I want to pray right now for uh, your strength. As we go back into our workplaces during the week, as we go back to school, as we go back into our daily routines, Father God, I want to pray that you give us the strength to be a good example. So by our good deeds, we can glorify you, Father. So, Father, I want to thank you. <laughs> Even though the accuser, the rat, the snitch wants to snitch us out, but we have an advocate who's defending us. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. You are so good to us. We don't deserve it, but you're so good. And Father, I want to pray right now for anyone who's struggling. Struggling with sin. I want to pray right now that as they make a decision to repent and turn away, from those things, Father, that you give them the strength and the courage they need. And Father, I want to silence the enemy right now. I want to silence the enemy. Help your children to know who they are. That they are chosen, a royal priest. Father, we just want to pray right now. Anything the enemy has stolen, Father God, anything that the enemy has placed on our lives, we want to break it right now in Jesus' mighty name. Set us free, Father God. Set us free. Set us free. Set us free. Set us free. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.
Now, before I, I, I want to give an opportunity. This is so, so important. Like I said, God is there with arms wide open. He wants you to come back home. Listen, if you are here and you um, don't feel loved, I want to tell you, God loves you. Like the prodigal son, God is waiting for you to say yes and come back to Him. He's there with arms wide open. If you're watching this online, I want to tell you that He was calling you back home. So, I want to, I want to, you can do that today by just praying this prayer and then you can get in touch with us and we'll help you with your next step. You want to pray this prayer right after me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on that cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me a new life. Fill me with your spirit. Take control over my life. It is yours. Change me. Transform me. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you.